हेलो डॉक्टर सुहास हैज जॉइंट Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, so, team, if we can uh, quickly start it off. Are we live on YouTube? Yes, my lad. We are. You may please proceed. Good. Ah, uh, just a minute. Suhas, Shri Hari, sir is there. We just need to make him co-host. Ah, uh, just can you please do that? He is unable to unmute himself. Just a minute. I have allowed it, sir. So. so can you try it now great uh, over to the mcs welcome sir welcome on board good evening one and all good evening one and all welcome back to yet another exciting session i am nile and here today we present you check date check date along with its collaborators acm lm iit jaipur heartfulness research center BMSC, Isel IIT Mandi, IEEE BMSC, Code Chef, Microsoft Innovations Club, Music Club, Dance Club, Dramatics Club, VIT Chennai, Skillanta, Ojashvi LPU, and Affinity Branding, along with our sponsors, Varigo Motors and Indicate, bring you the International Research Consortium, an extravagant event with illuminating panel discussions, enlightening. knowledgeable speeches from various respected speakers from across the world and of course a notion of opportunities for you in form of networking sessions idea thon competition and research expo dear attendees checked in brings to you its mega internship program from where you can gain insights into the real world For more info, please head out to our website. Also note that you must fill in the feedback forms for your attendance in the consortium. Now, without any further delay, let's invite our esteemed speaker for the session. Dr. Suhas Shrihari is an assistant VP of the Modern Development Center of Excellence at Wells Fargo, San Francisco, where he leads efforts in explainable ML models, hyperparameter optimization, anomaly detection, and sparse representations. He earned his PhD in electrical engineering from Purdue University. His research interests lie in explainable AI, ML, computational imaging, signal processing, optimization. statistical modeling estimation and prediction for a variety of real world applications he believes in blending and applied mathematics to engineer solutions for the significant concerns in healthcare finance and scientific imaging now i would like to hand over to suha sir to give his various insights the stage is all yours sir sir we are unable to hear you so can you hear us i think there's some Uh, so we cannot hear you uh, uh okay Is, can, can can you hear me now yes sir yes perfectly okay. audible so okay Over sorry you, sir. uh so what i'm going to do probably uh, i join on my phone 
and I'm going to mute myself on the computer, but hopefully I can share my screen on the computer. Let, let me do that. Okay, um, can you see my screen? Yes, I are screen sharing this as well. Okay, excellent. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about the technical glitch. It's, it's mostly on my side, but um, thank you so much for inviting me to, um, to share some of my perspectives from AI with, with you. Um, and it's been a fascinating event and I'm just so happy to be a part of it. Okay. The pleasure is also awesome. So um, what I thought of talking about today is um, a little bit of explainable machine learning and computational imaging. The idea behind this is sometimes, I mean, uh, we all have smartphones and we take pictures all the time, but sometimes what happens is you have, um, you, you have a shortage of some sort. You know, there's, um, there's a resolution problem. Every year, um, Samsung or Apple or, um, Xiaomi or whatever, they, they try to push their latest phones with more um, more pixels, better resolution, better signal to noise ratios so that your pictures look good. And the same thing happens in scientific imaging. For example, um, uh, I worked a lot with um, universities and um, research labs around the world. And, and one of the problems that we always had was whether you're using device like a microscope or a telescope, um, you have limits on how well they can perform. And um, at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do in improving the hardware of these devices. They're already very expensive. Just to give you an example, I, 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 like a few years ago, I worked with um, the University of California in Berkeley and they have a microscope. Okay, I need to translate the number, but they have a microscope and they paid 250 million American dollars for it. And this is unreasonably expensive. It's, um, it's more than GDP of several small countries sometimes. So <clears throat> the problem is even then you cannot see certain things. And that's where I come in. And that's where um, a lot of computational imaging topics come in, where you compute a better a quality image or a picture or a photograph based on the observations you have from your devices. And the second part of the talk is about explainable ML, which is the idea that you know, everybody uses AI or ML and, um, and you always get some sort of prediction from these algorithms, you should do that or the price of this market. Um, uh, this is how you price this market and, and so on. But um, a lot of times we don't understand, especially for healthcare applications. Um, a lot of the times um, you have situations where a doctor does not look at the, the scans, the MRI scans or the CT scans themselves. Um, the first pass is through an AI algorithm, which looks at all these scans and says, okay, this might be cancer or this might be a tumor. And um, the problem is now, how do you trust the algorithm? Because these are really high stake questions. If you do a um, misdiagnosis on important questions like this, it could lead, potentially lead to uh, death of the patient. So it's important to um, explain um, why the machine learning or the AI algorithm is, is predicting or it's saying the things that it is saying. Um, okay, so a little about me. Um, so my, my graduate school, oh, I, I think I should start here though. Um, my undergrad was in uh, BMS and uh, I had a lot of fun. Uh, it, it was one of the, some of the best years of my life. And, uh, and Dr. Ajishwari Hegde was 
um, one of my professors, she's such a fascinating person. So when she was involved with the IRC, um, I was like, I, ha I had to be a part of it. You know, uh, she was very instrumental in uh, my formation years at BMS. And, and, then, um, and then I did some cryptography in Canada during my master's. <clears throat> and then, um, so most of the stuff that I did during graduate school is, is actually what I continue doing to this day. Uh, so I went to Purdue. It's uh, in a small city in the state called Indiana. For those of you who know Chicago, it's about um, two hours south of Chicago. And the winters are terrible. So, um, coming from from Bangalore, um, so I grew up in Santa Clara, California, and then I spent several years in Bangalore. So none of those prepared me for the winters of Indiana, but I survived. <laughs> anyway, so I worked on uh, Bayesian estimation for nanoscale imaging. Um, actually, it's it's more than nanoscale imaging because a lot of images we took were. Um, Pico scale, which is 10 to the negative 12 meters. And <clears throat> I'm going to show you examples of that. And um, I just want to touch upon this topic um, that, I, is, that I worked on. It's called plug and play priors and consensus equilibrium. Essentially, what it means, uh, if you look at modern machine learning packages, um, you download something from Python. And essentially, what it does is you, it, you feed it some um, training examples. So if you give the algorithm a million examples of a dog, and then you ask, okay, so here's another picture of a dog. Can you identify correctly that it is a dog? So what is happening on the inside is that um, it looks at all the pictures of dogs and then it performs an optimization algorithm um, to, uh, to maximize the probability of the algorithm correctly identifying that it's a dog. And then when you um, show it a different unseen example of a new dog that it's never seen before, hopefully if your algorithm has trained correctly, um, it will identify that it's a dog. Now the core operation of such machine learning algorithms all around us is that there is an optimization module that's, uh, that's inside. And, and um, typically it's called, um, um, this works on a, um, frequentist statistical basis. I'm going to talk a little about that, but nothing too crazy. But sometimes what happens is when you have, so the modern machine learning algorithms are premised on the fact that we have tons of data. We have um, hordes and hordes of data. And, and then we have a powerful computer like the NVIDIA GPUs, and then we can train the algorithms. Um, but oftentimes that's not possible because we don't have um, tons of data. Uh, one example is, for, for example, if you want to understand the surface topology of Mars, um, it's, um, it's one of the projects that we have been interested in at um, Oak Ridge National Lab, where I'm a scientist. Um, not a lot of people have been to Mars, um, and there are only a few rovers on Mars. They take some pictures sometimes, but compared to the number of selfies, the number of TikTok videos, the number of uh, medical images that we have, the number of images we have of Mars is very small, very, very small. And, and therefore, um, the optimization algorithm finds it very hard to, uh, to um, understand the structure of Mars and, uh, or the surface topology of Mars. So for problems like in scientific imaging, for problems like that, what, uh, what we end up doing is uh, if you have very limited data, we then supplement the shortcoming of having very limited data with a knowledge we have from some other source. And um, I'm gonna talk a little about that, but essentially that idea of supplementing the lack of data with theoretical knowledge about the um, object that we are estimating or understanding, that is called a prior model, prior probability model within a Bayesian framework. Um, so, so we'll talk about this later, but plug and play, uh, this is my baby. It's been um, used in hundreds of science applications. Um, but uh, if any of you uses the um, Samsung S20, um, Samsung Galaxy S20, 
um, the fingerprint sensor is based, the biometrics for that is based on um, my plug and play algorithm. Okay, so that's the background. Uh, what I do at ORNL is um, right now I'm working on uh, uh, secure face recognition algorithms. The problem is a lot of times you have um, security footage or you walk into an airport or a, a transit center at a bus stand and these are all monitored. So there's live security footage that comes in and there's some officer in the background um, who looks at these and says, okay, that looks like a suspect. But uh, now the problem is that um, there are a lot of these groups, um, for example, um, based on, um, so uh, in, in, in America, especially, um, there have been a lot of targeted crime against Asian Americans or Asians in general. In, in the recent past. And then um, there are also a historic, there's a historic problem with the black community. And um, this, this is very unfortunate. Uh, it should never happen, but well, the truth is sometimes it happens. And this is because uh, the, the people are biased against certain other types of people. And there's, there's also a lot of other things. So for example, um, um, a white male man a ma a might be less suspicious to people than um, a black woman. Or so there is also a, a question of gender that is involved. And so um, a, a Muslim person might be more inclined to be believed to be a terrorist than uh, somebody who's non-Muslim. And um, because of, and it might be true, it might not be true. So the, the whole idea is that um, the face, the minute you see somebody's face, we make, we tend to make a lot of judgment about them. And in order to prevent that, uh, one of these um, uh, projects that we are doing here at the lab is try to uh, mask the features of the face, but still um, have a robust face recognition. And I'm also working on fraud detection in healthcare. Um, healthcare is a very big topic in America, probably more so than in India, but um, some of the problem is that there is so much fraud that happens. There is a doctor. This, this problem is in India too. I know this because it happened to my grandfather. Um, he went in for, he had some, he had, okay, he was 92. Okay. So he, it was a pretty advanced age. He went in with a knot in his tummy, in his stomach. And he was like, okay, something doesn't feel well. He got every single test done that was on the roster of the hospital. And uh, well, we loved him. So we, we paid the bill, but that so and so, but sometimes you begin to question did the doctor Neil really need to they really need to do 102 different diagnostic tests on them just because we're going to pay and um they know we're going to pay because you know um every time you're somebody's in a hospital a loved one is in the hospital you want the best care for them so that is a um sometimes can lead to a fraudulent um system within healthcare. And um, so I work on detecting um, fraud like that. Again, if you go back to my previous slide um, uh, here about explainable ML, it's very important because if I'm calling out a doctor and saying um, he's fraudulent or she's fraudulent because of this activity, I better be sure. Uh, why, do, why does my algorithm think it's fraudulent? <clears throat> and um, okay, so um, okay, so I spoke about some of my previous work. I spoke about uh, what I did at Purdue. Um, I was also at Wells Fargo for about four years prior to um, uh, prior to the lab, and I worked uh, on hyperparameter optimization, which is essentially saying if you have a machine learning algorithm, there are hundreds of different parameters that you've got to set, and it's it's um, not very intuitive or obvious have you set those parameters, but the result of your machine learning algorithm depends heavily on the parameters you choose. So what is there a smart way, an automated way of choosing those parameters is the question that we tried solving. Um, and then anomaly detection, um, but, but instead of healthcare, I, I worked on financial crime. So if somebody steals your credit card information and tries to buy a leather bag in Mumbai, um, that, you know, that could be potentially anomalous because that's not, you don't do that often. And so it could be also fraudulent. So I worked on those algorithms, um, uh, during Wells, my Wells Fargo stand. Okay. So recently, um, um, 
you know, I'm going to be starting as a faculty at the University of Tennessee, which is, um, so I'm still going to be a scientist at the lab. And um, I have a bunch of things that, that's going on there. And explainable ML is, um, is actually at the forefront of the topic, so which is why I want to talk to you a little about it today. Okay, so um, there are two parts. So let me, um, let me start with the computational imaging. And, oh, I'm gonna do this a little unstructured. So I'm gonna skip ahead and then come back. Oh, this is bad planning on my part, but okay. <clears throat> so let me show you, let me show you what we, we are able to achieve and then go back and say, okay, here's how we do it. So, you know, you're, you're, maybe you're motivated to listen to me. Um, so if you look at the picture to your right, uh, just look at the blue box, the, the left column, and uh, these look like blobs. So they're highly pixelated, which means this is what I was saying. This is from a $250 million microscope, um, and we pushed it to the limits of it. And still, we don't have um, uh, the highest resolution that we want to achieve. So <clears throat> you start with the low resolution input. And so for your, in terms of your camera, what it means is if you have an older camera, like let's say from 2012, and if you compare that with your newer camera on your, on your smartphone, you realize how much of a difference there is, how much of a quality improvement that we've been, we've been uh, able to make. So take an old camera from 2010, 2012, um, three megapixel camera, four megapixel camera, and take a picture of something. And then um, also take a picture with your uh, newest iPhone or Samsung phone, and then compare uh, the difference between them. So the question is, this is a question of super resolution. The question is, if you have a bad camera with the lower resolution, can you take a picture from it, pass it through Suhas' al algorithm, and then get a high resolution picture as though you took the picture on your new best camera. Is that possible? Now, we try exploring that um, for um, a different problem. Instead of choosing a camera and a natural image or a selfie, what we uh, decided to do was use this idea on microscopes. So the picture you see on the left is called the ground truth image. That's how it should be. <clears throat> so on the bottom left, all the gray uh, carpet-like material you see is carbon. So that's a carbon nano substrate. And then all the dots you see on top, they're individual gold atoms. So ladies and gentlemen, this is what your jewelry is made of, okay? Although this is not a color picture, but um, you see all those individual gold atoms. And, but if you look at the blue box, which is low resolution input, those, um, the, the uh, gold atoms are hardly visible, especially in the bottommost row. So the top row is medium quality. Um, the middle row is slightly worse. The bottom row is the worst quality image that we took. And from all of those, if you look at the red box to the right, that is um, my algorithm trying to reconstruct a higher resolution uh, picture of the gold atoms from the lower resolution input. So, um, and um, this also leads to a faster acquisition of images. Sometimes even if you have the capability to take a very high resolution image, you don't have the time to do it. An example is this. So you're passing through an <coughs> orbit of Mars. So Martian imaging has recently been very popular in certain pockets of, um, uh, in certain circles of my research. And um, you look at the surface of Mars, you're taking a picture from an orbiter, like um, um, like the orbiter that we have, um, like the Indian or orbiter that we have. And the, the problem is um, the orbiter goes so fast around that you can't stay still and take a picture for a long time. And it's proven that if you can stay there for, if you can stay in one place on the orbit for a while, you can take a better picture. And um, so sometimes the quality is reduced and there is nothing you can do about it. And so in all of those situations, you have essentially a high, no a noisy, a low resolution input. So we want to go from the low to the high resolution. So that, that, that is uh, one core application of my work. Now, 
to me, I don't know, because I'm, I'm so close to the problem, it almost seems that this is magic, because if you look at the middle two columns, the cubic and SISR is an algorithm that came out of uh, a school called, a university called Technion in Israel. Uh, it's, it's one of the, um, <clears throat> it's comparable to a school like MIT or, 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 or Stanford in terms of how good they are. But um, if you compare their outputs to what we've been able to achieve, there's a tremendous amount of difference. And that difference is because of a simple fact that we were able to capture, which I'm gonna talk about. So this is um, um, signal processing at its <coughs> funniest. Okay. This is, okay, so here's, this makes me happy. So it's a simple equation. If you look at, okay, I'm gonna explain the terms a little. Normally how um, your, any machine learning algorithm works is um, look at the box, the first box to the right of the equation, which um, is labeled forward model or likelihood. So most machine learning algorithms um, express your problem as a probability, and then they try to maximize the probability. Now, why is typically the uh, whatever signal or image that is measured or is observed? So if you take a crappy picture, if you take a really bad quality picture, that is why. And X is the um, quantity you're trying to estimate. You're trying to get out of your um, optimization. <clears throat> so in our case, Y would be the bad quality image and X would be the good quality image, but you don't know what X is. That's what you're trying to find out. That's what you're trying to compute. So um, in traditional machine learning algorithms, what happens is you have thousands or tens of thousands or millions of examples of these pairs X and Y. And, and um, given all these pairs, uh, the probability of Y given X, and this is called the likelihood probability, that this is, tried, th this is, this is maximized. So all of these algorithms try to maximize this term. Now the problem, as I was saying a few minutes ago, is that sometimes you, this only works well if you have a lot of data but sometimes you don't have many, some, some scientific applications, you don't have a lot of data. So in, in those situations, what happens is um, you would be highly, it's highly beneficial to have a, another term called the prior term, which is on the top right, it's P of X. So one example of this is, okay, let's say you have a calculator and um, so you're squaring, you're squaring numbers. So you have your input number is two, the square is four. And um, so you see only the square of the number. Okay. So let's say you know what you're doing and you see the output, but you don't see the input. If I told you um, I squared a number and the number is four and the output is four, uh, what is the number? This is a classic problem. This is essentially the nutshell of all of machine learning, by the way. Um, given the output, try to guess the input. <clears throat> now, um, you would say, okay, the number probably was two because you squared it, uh, but it could also be negative two, minus two. Um, so that's when you don't have enough data. But, um, okay, if I also have another, another data point, I said, uh, okay, I cubed the number and the cube of this number is minus eight. And then you know for sure if the square is plus four and the cube is minus eight, then the number has to be minus two. But um, you need those two pieces of information to decipher that the value is minus two. But sometimes that's what I mean by lack of data. Um, you have the information of anything about the cube. So you only have the square information. So what do you do? So you can't solve this problem. You have multiple um, possibilities for the value of X. So in that case, what we do is hopefully we know something about the quantity X that we're trying to estimate. Okay, maybe the question, okay, what is X? All, all these variables always have a physical interpretation. There are never X and Y, okay? They always have a physical interpretation. So if I tell you X actually stands for the number of um, cousins you have, okay? The number of first cousins you have, and then um, it cannot be negative two 
So you know it, X has to be positive. So that extra piece of information will compensate for the lack of data that you don't have a cube output. So hopefully, you know, this is helpful to understand why the prior model tries can compensate for lack of data in the likelihood. <clears throat> so in most of the Bayesian, like you said, when you have a prior model and you're looking at the likelihood and the prior together, this is called a Bayesian statistical estimation or inference. The most machine learning algorithms only look at the likelihood and that makes them what's called frequentist. It's a, it's a totally different, uh, uh, wing of statistics. Now, um, so just in incorporating these prior models, we were able to get um, the results that we, we are getting, and that makes a lot of difference. Okay, now um, there is there is some math. I decided to you know talk about the intuition of this problem rather than you know drill your head at seven p.m. What the time? Seven thirty at night. Um, so there, there is quite a, uh, there's some math. You can read my papers. I'd be happy if somebody reaches out to me, I'd be happy to talk to you. But um, I'm gonna skip the math a little. And let me just say that uh, my collaborators and I have developed a, an algorithm, which is a plug and play that I was talking about. And in plug and play, it's easy to um, bring in prior models. So if I'm in the elevator with, you know, uh, Professor Sien Rao, and he tells me, okay, based on all my years as as a nibble, uh, you know, as like a, a, as a really top scientist, this is what I believe. When he says that, it's very hard for me, uh, generally, to express that as uh, probability p of x. What he's saying is valuable. Um, he's a top scientist, but unless he gives me a specific mathematical formula for what he's saying, it's very hard for me to say, this is what P of X is. What my core work, um, just to give you an idea, is to translate elevator conversations or your ideas that you might have or an algorithm you download um, from the internet very easily as P of X and still have a solid mathematical foundation to make it work with the likelihood. <clears throat> So that is the idea of plug and play, that you can express the prior probability and make it mathematically consistent. Okay. So there are, there's a lot of, so, so every time you have a mathematically convenient tool, the question is, are you doing the right thing? Um, so for example, you, like, okay, let's say you're making Pavaji and it's a, let's say it's a, it's a 20 minute recipe, okay? Or, or a 25 minute recipe. And if I tell you, hey, I can make pao bhaji as good as you in four minutes, then um, you should question me, <laughs> you know? How, how, do you know? how do you know what you're making is correct? How do you know the final outcome of your pao bhaji is the same as mine? So, and, and this is also true in, in math where you've got to prove um, everything. You can't just make claims. Mine's as good as that. Um, so uh, the papers I've written also deal with uh, what were called convergence proofs that my handy method converges to uh, the output that we would have gotten had we used a very long method that takes 10,000 years. Okay, so we spoke about this. This is one application. This is just a different image of the same application. This is a, um, so this is a marine mollusk and they have, they have shells. So think of it as, um, you know, a, a seashell that, that you find on, on the beach. And if you take a microscope and an electron microscope and zoom into it, these are the structures you find. If there's a crack in the shell, you know, sometimes in it, um, you see snails or turtles and they go through stuff and sometimes they have an impact on the shell and that cracks their shell a little bit. So the, this image looks at the crack of the, those shells and understanding those cracks is very important because humans also crack very similarly to some of the shells. Um, so the bone structures are sometimes similar. So understanding them is extremely important and you face the same problem again. You don't have a good enough image to, to look at those cracks. 
And again, um, my algorithm is applicable. One of the other things that's not mentioned here is there was a new uh, portion of the galaxy. Uh, uh, so some stars were never seen before. And somebody extended uh, my algorithm to telescopes and they were able to see for the first time these new stars in our galaxy. So if you're interested in any of those, um, you know, talk to me, I'm always happy to talk to people. <clears throat> Um, the same thing could be, this is a slightly different problem. This is where um, a majority of the pixels in your picture or video, they're missing. And it's called uh, in-painting. So if you look at the um, top left figure where um, you just have some lines, information is present only on those lines. Everywhere there's a black, we have missing pixel values. Now this can happen in some scenarios. Um, one example is that if somebody photobombs you, and you're taking a family picture, you only take one picture, somebody photobombs you, you got to remove that person from the picture. Now, Adobe Photoshop can do this well today. But what people need to realize is that the algorithm that Photoshop uses is an algorithm like this. It's called in-painting. And um, so I worked on such algorithms for scientific problems. Um, and then the, this is silicon dioxide. This is, um, this is again, nanoscale imaging. So with our methods, the bottom three are results from my methods. So you see the difference between the bottom three and the top method, which is an industry standard. What I'm trying to show you is really by expanding your idea of statistics, uh, you can say, well, machine learning is machine learning. You just throw data at a powerful processor and it's gonna do work for you. No, it, it's not magic. So sometimes you'll have to you know, get your hands dirty and. Uh, open up the objective function, the loss function, whatever you do in your AI module, and try to um, understand this in a Bayesian format. And that's going to improve um, a lot of things that we do on a daily basis. This is especially critical for healthcare. Um, we can spot tumors. I worked with Siemens on it, where the interference of human tissues based on the uh, magnetic flux in your uh, MRI machines, the interference is too much. The Siemens machines had um, false tumors because of that. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not only for Siemens, it's the same for GE, the same for Philips. They all have problems it's called a bias field problem in MRI. And uh, one, of the, um, one of the only ways to solve that convincingly is to use Bayesian modeling. So my message for you is try to expand your idea of statistics, try to go Bayesian. And in a lot of situations, it could be very instrumental in getting reliable outputs. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna spend five minutes. I don't know how much time do I have? I'm gonna spend five minutes on this section. Um, okay, so neural networks or deep learning or neural nets or any kind of learning these days, and it's all, it's all the um, rage. For example, um, you, you, in most of the apps you use, if you're using Instagram and you use a filter, um, and if you're using TikTok and you use, um, a, I don't know, I don't know, I don't use TikTok, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something stupid about TikTok. Okay, so, um, it, so if you use any of the modern um, algorithms based on Facebook or whatever, everything typically is in your real network. And especially, um, in the, in the age of privacy concerns, it's important to understand what those neural networks are doing. Also, it, MRI, scan, um, MRI scans are given to neural networks for analysis, for example. And, it, and like I said, in order to say that's legitimately a tumor or it's not a tumor, it's a lesion, it's nothing, it's just a mole, whatever you're gonna say, you gotta understand why the algorithm is making that prediction so you understand if you can trust the algorithm or it needs more work. Maybe you've got to retrain it. You've got, you need a stronger um, AI machine. So, well, it's estimated that by 2030, the economic output from AI is, is going to be $13 trillion. It's bigger than India's GDP. So if you are spending um, and, and making that kind of money from AI, we better understand um, what goes on inside it and, um, and what the limitations are. And also a uh, new thing, and especially in, um, in the U.S. these days, is called uncertainty quantification. There is uncertainty uh, that comes with machine learning and AI predictions 
do we understand that uncertainty? Um, so what I'm thinking is um, these slides are public. So I can maybe uh, share a copy of the slides with uh, the organizers or if you're interested. So take a look at the slides and uh, we can always talk more, but I just want to give you the intuition. If you look at, in, so what we want to do is um, have you, and if you played the game of 20 questions, and, and so let's say I have, um, I used to play this game with my cousins when I was younger and uh, it was called name, place, things or something. So I, I basically um, think of a name or a place or a thing. Okay. Let's say, um, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, um, um, somebody. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking of my, my, my dad. And then, um, so my cousin is supposed to guess. Um, who that, who, what I'm thinking of. And they asked me, is the person you're thinking, is it a person that you're thinking? Or, and then I say yes or no. If it's not, a, if it's, if it's a person, yes. And then they ask, is it male or female? And then you say male and, and so on. You get the picture. So after asking about a few, six or seven questions, sometimes you don't even have to go to 20 questions. You can understand or guess what I'm thinking about. Now, such algorithms in machine learning are called um, tree-based learning. So it's like a decision tree. Every point in their decision tree is a single question, which is a yes or no question. And based on that, you can understand, you can go further and further and further. And in a few steps, you can understand what's happening. Now, um, neural networks are different because, e so you, you see the red or the orange brown or I can't, I don't know. Am I colorblind? I don't know. Okay, seems like brown or orange. If you see that dot uh, circle, that's a, a representation of a neuron. A neuron is basically the same neuron in our head. So, but we have a mathematical representation of it in order to build these algorithms called neural networks. And, and they have multiple inputs, exactly like our neurons. And sometimes when the inputs are a certain way, the neurons fire. That the neuron fires, there's an activation, and then there's an output from the neuron, and then that neuron is connected to a different neuron. So, in the in the just like in the brain, <clears throat> there's a whole interconnection of neurons, and sometimes some neurons fire, and that triggers multiple neurons to be fired, and like so. So multiple people have spoken about mindfulness and meditation. So that's exactly very similar to certain things. Uh, uh, so that also depends. So processes like these also depend on your neurons firing in a controlled manner or in, in a manner that's favorable to the outcome. In order to understand these firings, especially in complicated networks, um, we can model the neurons. Instead of neurons, we can model them as decision trees, which is like playing 20 questions with your brain. Essentially, that's what it is. Okay, so you can, there are different operations called convolution pooling, um, and which are very popular with neural networks. I'm not gonna bore you with that, but my basic premise is a lot of different operations can be expressed very succinctly as decision trees. At the end of it, what you're left with is a sequence of decision trees, yes or no, um, you know, is the planet red? And then, uh, so maybe you're trying to figure out if, if, if you're looking at Mars. And the neural network figures that out, but you're casting that as a 20 questions problem in the framework of that. So you understand what's happening inside the neural network. So each layer of a neural network is a sequence of decision trees. Um, and then also to understand, we use an idea from game theory. Uh, I think John Nash and equilibriums and everything. It's, it's an idea called Shapley additive explanations. For example, if you list a house, for sale, and what is the price? Let's say the price you set is two crore rupees, and why is that price appropriate? Then you say, well, my house has four bedrooms, three bathrooms, it's in Koromangla, and all those things. So if you're assigning the value based on each individual feature, okay, it's in Koromangla, so maybe that's gonna drive up the price quite a bit. How much effect of the location um, can you see in the pricing? How much effect do the number of bedrooms have in the price? So the individual contributions of all these different features of your house um, 
uh, what can you understand the individual contributions of all of these? So that's where Shapley analysis comes in and we can use those ideas to understand what is the individual contribution of a particular pixel or a part of it, uh, an image that contributes to you saying that picture is a dog. Why did you say it's a dog? Why is it not a cat? And then you say, well, look at the tail or look at the whiskers, they're different. Look at the eyes, they're different. But if you look at the belly of a dog or a cat, one tiny portion might look very similar. So that portion is not very important. So I'll give you an example. Here, um, and here's, the, uh, here's a picture of a panda bear. And if you, okay, so the algorithm correctly identifies it as a panda. You add some noise to it, it's, the noise is not even visible. I have exaggerated the noise here. So, and the right image is the noisy image, but to a human, it's still a panda. I don't even see the noise. But the same algorithm now says it's a gibbon, which is a type of monkey, you know? And why, what happened? Why was, so this is an example where AI is going crazy. Imagine what would happen if this happens in a medical setting or in a healthcare setting where the AI says somebody has cancer and they don't. Imagine the kind of stress. Or if they say you don't have cancer, but you do, and you never get treated for it. Or if the algorithm does not say, does not um, predict an impending heart attack in six months. It actually saved my grandfather once. Uh, they predicted his heart attack and uh, he lived for a bit uh, a while longer because of that. So imagine if these mistakes happen in, in healthcare settings. So my um, research is trying to understand the inner workings of these algorithms and see why certain decisions are being taken. And, and based on Shapley analysis and my decision tree approach, um, my explainable AI says that you see the red box on the gibbon image, um, uh, the panda, but incorrectly recognizes a gibbon. That red square is where 35% of the decision making is happening. If you look at um, that portion on the gibbon's face, it could be a little confusing. So really the solution is for the algorithm to focus not on that, but on broader features so that it wouldn't make mistakes like these. Anyway, so I just scratched the surface. There's a lot to computational imaging in AI and it's, it's reshaping the way we look at the world and it's becoming an increasingly important part <coughs> of our life that we can't ignore. We can't say, we cannot say the algorithm will take care of it because it's not, it's up to us. So embrace all the hard problems, you know, and um, statistics is, is uh, probability and statistics, they're very powerful tools. Um, um, this is, okay, I don't, you don't need this, but I also have a course on foundations of signal processing, estimation theory, optimization, and machine learning. If you're interested, talk to me. Um, all my courses are free, by the way. Um, I think education should be free. So. I'm not here to sell anything to anybody. I'm just here to share my experience with you. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, MCs, are you there? Uh, thank you so much, sir. That was a mesmerizing session. Thank you for your valuable insights. If anyone has any query regarding the session, please let our speaker know. Uh, so I have one uh, query. Um, mm -hmm. when, when you did mention that even the Philips uh, or maybe other companies, um, MRI machines which are coming in the, in the market, they also have mm -hmm. some biases into it and, and some errors are there. Um, then how should we take uh, care of them as well? Like how should we consider them as well while preparing an algorithm maybe for diagnosing a disease uh, from an MRI scan? Oh, um, specifically for an MRI scan, um, it has nothing to do with the company, which is why I was, so I don't know anything about Philips. Uh, I, I worked only for Siemens. And the reason I said Philips and GE is that this is a fundamental problem in how the magnetic field interacts with tissues. So imagine there is a cross-section of an MRI um, image in your abdomen, and you have a liver, you have your spleen, you have the pancreas. So all these tissues are right next to each other. Now, because of the different composition of these tissues, 
uh, they interact differently with the magnetic flux. Now, this problem is if you have a 1.5 Tesla or a 3 Tesla magnetic scanner, the issue is not too bad. But if you have a 5 or a 7 Tesla scanner at the high end, the magnetic flux is so strong that you begin to see these problems. And um, as long as you understand the physics behind it and the biology behind it, that's, that's how you start fixing those problems. For example, um, now there's this other area in similar processing called, har called wavelets, right? Um, I don't know if you ever did wavelets in signal processing. We all took, uh, like, uh, so like, I took signal processing as the course in my undergrad, for example. And then there was this tiny thing called wavelets. And then you totally forget about it. And then after many years, I go to Siemens. I ended up using wavelets to solve this problem. And then what you do is, I, in particular, I use HAR wavelets. It's a one type, it's a well, particular type of wavelet which enforces constancy in tissues. So if it's a liver, as long as it's one liver, the image has to be rough, more or less constant within the liver. And if the next organ, which might be the uh, pancreas, you're, you're allowed to um, make a difference in the image intensity. So, um, so you need the physics, the short answer to your question is you need physics knowledge to understand what is really happening. If you really just threw all the data at an AI neural network, it's very hard to solve such problems. And then once you understand that, okay, each tissue is different, then you can model them as P of X in this, um, in this equation. So this P of X is where you can use a wavelet to indicate that each tissue is its own tissue and it has to have a constant, almost a constant value. That's one way of solving it. <laughs> Um, any other question? Really impressive. Yes, sir. That was really impressive. So just one more question. And also, meanwhile, sir, we are receiving amazing feedback for you. There are amazing praises coming. That it was an amazing session, sir. Thank you. Uh, oh, and thank various you. Uh, comments are there, sir. Very positive comments. Oh, thank you. So just one more query is there. Um, if you're going for a different kind of, uh, if you want to connect three different kinds of data together, for an example, a textual data, an image data, and also a medical image data, um, how, what will be your suggestion that how we should move forward? To oh, that's, that that's a great question. Um, um, I think one of the easiest ways of doing that, okay, um, I'm gonna show you some, the reason I'm sharing my screen, this is shameless advertisement, uh, consensus. I'll give you um, one easy way of dealing. Okay, Suhas, it's in here somewhere. Okay, um, I can send a link to this, but essentially this is called multimodal fusion. Um, if you look at multimodal solutions, you have different modes, you have text, you have images, you have some other thing, you have a video, you can combine all of them in a principled manner. And, um, so, so the, the issue is that all of these need to talk to each other and be consistent. So for example, if there's a, if there's a bomb explosion in the video and in the image, that in, in, the, in, the pic, in the audio, everybody's calm, nobody's panicked. Now you see that's a problem because usually like remember the time 9-11 happened, you look at the videos and you switch on the radio and everybody or the TV and the news, everybody's panicked. Um, people are crying. So there has to be some sort of consensus between your different modes of information. So the new concept we developed, uh, this, is, this is coming out of Purdue, uh, it's called consensus equilibrium. At the equilibrium of your analysis, there should be consensus between different modes. And we ensured that, so this is a framework which you can use. There is a Python code implementation for this. I'd be happy to share. So um, you don't have to read through the entire paper. Um, this is me. These are my collaborators. Anyway, so um, it's it's a very principled approach of doing it. We uh, so there. Okay, this equation here. Okay, okay, this doesn't make sense. But um, if you go through the paper, uh, there we have shown exactly that how different modes can be fused, and uh, we have very um, strict convergence proofs. This is mathematically very precise. We have multiple theorems that show this is the way you've got to tackle this problem. The question asked me, so I'd be happy to share this um, with everybody.
that would be really helpful <coughs> and amazing work. So now it's time for vote of thanks, sir. And I will take immense pleasure. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And then we can see how much the studies has brought up for everyone to contribute in, in these part of studies, these part of researches. So that was some, something very very amazing sir and thank you for sharing it it, it means a lot no, ab ab absolutely my pleasure uh, thank you for inviting me because my team to kindly uh, present the memento to our Uh, I hope I am audible now. Uh, yeah, I can hear. Um, I'm so sorry for the network issues at my place today, but I'm extremely oh, thankful, happens. sir. What an amazing, what an amazing and qualitative session you have brought. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And and definitely, it's going to help us throughout in our journey. Whenever we are working on ML or AI algorithms or creating our newer algorithms. Please accept the sir the token of gratitude from our and for your amazing contribution and valuable time what you have in, uh, invested with us. So thank you, thank you oh, very thank much, you. Sir. and we will look forward Absolute to pleasure, more uh, more more interactions with you and your particular lab, sir. So absolutely, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for having and me. Take care, sir. Be happy. Thank you. Yep. I would like well. to thank, thank uh, two amazing mentors. Dr. Susan Elias and Dr. Rajeshwari Hegre for their amazing contribution to, towards our team, towards this personal research consortium. Because without them, this would not be a possibility. Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for being there and always guiding us throughout. Uh, I will also like to thank our sponsors, Verivo Motors and EduCheck for having faith in us and their trust in us and each and every collaborators for their amazing support and com complete organizing team. Thank you very much, guys. And stay tuned for the another session coming up on Power of Thoughts by Dr. Rajeshwari Hegre. Before that, we will be having a small live concert. So, uh, Achyut, if 